Iran, somehow the sanest of the US's current adversaries. Today we're talking about the case of Rubin versus the Islamic Republic of Iran, one of those cases that is diminished just a little bit when you realize that it's not a corned beef sandwich taking on the Middle Eastern powerhouse. We're talking about this case because the Supreme Court just released a decision on it. So finally, we'll have a Supreme Court Saturday with some finality to it. Don't worry though, no spoilers until the end. So what happened with Rubin versus the Islamic Republic of Iran? Well, we have to travel back to September 4th, 1997 when... Now this horrific attack killed seven bystanders, severely injured eight people, and injured many more. So why would any of this lead the US to sue Iran? Well, unfortunately for Iran, eight of the people injured in that blast were Americans, who went home and did what Americans do best, file a civil suit. This 2003 case of Rubin vs. the Islamic Republic of Iran was filed against Iran for materially supporting Hamas, and surprisingly flew completely under the radar despite the fact that the DC court ruled that Iran needed to pay them a settlement of $72.5 million. Although, when faced with the tough decision of whether to pay Americans for materially helping terrorists or keep researching nuclear weapons, they chose the latter. In fact, according to Harvard Law Review, in recent years, the lawsuits have piled up to the point where the Islamic Republic of Iran owes American citizens billions of dollars. Although, for the last 12 years, Iran has been saying, eh, the check's in the mail and should be arriving any day now. So this brings us to the court case today, Rubin vs. the Islamic Republic of Iran, which asks the question of what Iranian assets can be seized and subsequently sold by America in order to pay off victims of Iranian-backed attacks. Before we start this Supreme Court case, I, we really dove into some bureaucratic nuance that I'm going to largely skip in my analysis. They said the word section and subsection like a gun rights person says second amendment. And at one point it even went as far as The property is subject to execution of any judgment relating to a claim for which the state uh, is not immune. Again, the words following judgment are modifying the word judgment, which makes sense under the last antecedent rule. No, just stop. Sorry, but oh man, after this episode, I have a great understanding of the sections and subsections of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Basically, what I'm saying is, because I use clips from the case that are going to have people talking about super specific sections of this act, don't worry, I'll explain what you need to know without going into... 1605A, capital A, lowercase a. Alright, so without further ado, let's jump right in. You'll hear argument next in case 16534, Rubin versus the Islamic Republic of Iran. First, we need to talk about the real subject of this debate, which is the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Now, this act has traditionally been interpreted to mean it's that only property used for commercial activity in the United States can be seized. Okay, well, that sounds pretty cut and dry. Unfortunately, because the U.S. has had an embargo on Iran for over 30 years, we aren't exactly swimming in Iranian commercial assets. Now this brings us to a court decision that has impacted the seizure of countries' assets a lot. It is not limited to overturning the Banchek uh, decision? No, I, I don't agree with that, Mr. Chief Justice. I think what's going on there is Congress wanted to make it very clear that Banchek was no longer, no longer going to be a barrier in these cases. All right, everyone, let's put on our zebra pants and our neon jackets and head back to 1983's Supreme Court case of First National City Bank, also known as Citibank, versus Banco Para El Comercio Exterior de Cuba. This is actually a pretty hilarious premise for a case. Prepare for a flashback and a flashback, though, because this case really started in 1960. When This was the scene of turmoil in the capital, Havana, as the climax of revolution was reached. Anyone suspected of sympathy for the Batista regime came in for a rough time. As you can probably imagine, a communist revolution isn't exactly great for a country's financial sector. So you're telling me you guys make money by passing around money and speculating on the markets instead of contributing to society? Uh-huh. 
Alright, here's a hoe, you're a farmer now. The problem emerged when, in 1960, the new Cuban government created the Banco para el Comercio Exterior de Cuba, which it used to provide loans for international trade. This Cuban bank got a letter of credit or guaranteed future payment for a local sugar company planning on selling their sugar to America from Citibank. Only problem, just days later the Cuban government seized all of the Citibank's assets that were in Cuba. Then, in an awkward moment that came when Banco Para El Comercio Exterior de Cuba, who had received most of Citibank's seized assets, had to call Citibank and say, hey, we haven't gotten that money you promised for the sugar farmer yet. Should we be expecting that anytime soon? Then Banco Para El Comercio Exterior de Cuba sued Citibank when Citibank said, you guys just stole billions in assets from us. Why don't you just take it out of there? Now back to 1983, when after apparently 23 years of deliberation, it was found that the Cuban bank and Citibank had to settle their differences and liabilities. After 23 years, Goliath beat David. Woohoo! This left us with an important point of precedence though, because the Supreme Court created some specific rules that impact the case we're talking about today. It established the idea of a veil of ownership. And let me tell you, the justices in today's case were talking about veil piercing left, right, and center. In America, unlike in Cuba, you can only seize assets from a bank if you can prove that bank is owned by the country you were trying to seize assets from. For example, if Citibank owned Iranian assets and the government seized those assets, it would technically be stealing that money from Citibank's balance sheets just about as much as it would be from that other country. In this case though, we were able to prove that Banco Para El Comercio Exterior de Cuba was Cuban. Though, maybe, and hear me out, it was the de Cuba part that was the dead giveaway. The problem here is that the best thing America can generally do is keeping Iranian assets on ice because they're held by a private bank. Now to put this in perspective, imagine you walk into a bank demanding they give you all the money from a specific account. You're still a bank robber, not a thief. Now scale that up to the estimated $2 billion in Iranian money held in US banks and you're really going to mess up their balance sheets taking all that money. Now I hear what one of you is screaming at his computer monitor at this very moment. But Steven, what about the time when in 2016 the US seized $2 billion of Iranian central bank money from Citibank? Well, if you really love talking about sections and reading paperwork, you can look up the case Bank Mikhazi versus Peterson. But the basic idea was that, in this specific Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court was able to prove that the account was held and completely controlled by the Iranian state bank. Now, this opens up a problem though. If Iran owes us billions in civil court cases and won't pay us, how can we collect? Well, in this case, the government was looking to seize... The Achaemenid or Persopolis clay tablets were loaned to the University of Chicago back in 1937. They were discovered by archaeologists in 1933 and are legally the property of the National Museum of Iran and Iran's Cultural Heritage Organization. The artifacts came with the understanding that they would be returned to Iran. Yes, we're taking your tablets, but they've been on loan to us since before World War II. We're like that neighbor who borrowed something from your great granddad and just won't give it back. So the first question here is, who owns these artifacts? Because if the university owns them, then seizing them is stealing from the university and not Iran. Their rights have been, from 1939 on, they have this property. Well, since 1980, they've had the property because Iran couldn't get it back for a big part of that time. And for a big part of the time before that, Every now and then, Iran was asking, when are you going to finish, when are you going to finish studying these things? And, uh, and they were not very forthcoming. When this lawsuit was filed, they moved into, they expedited their study of the assets because they realized that they might lose them. Oh yeah, they've expedited their study? I mean, they've only been researching them for 85 years, but maybe if they try extra hard, they could do it in the 86th year. So this art has actually functioned as a frozen asset since the Iranian revolution in 1980. This ownership issue was later summed up when it was said that In the briefs they say they're trustees 
uh, or they were entrusted. They don't call themselves trustees even. They say they were entrusted with this. Every, they use language, but they never say we have a concrete right in these, in these assets. And if they do, the court can, the district court, when it orders the sale, it can make accommodation for that. This entire discussion led to the much wider question when everyone in the court looked at each other and realized that if the U.S. rejects this court case, would Iran, I don't know, become a little bit more assertive of while wanting its stuff back? Well, assuming you're right, does that mean if you lose here, you think Iran will be able to repatriate the assets? Absolutely. There's nothing in the way. They did. They did. We lost. Um, we lost in the district court. And there was another collection of Iran-owned assets. Um, and on the eve of the, the argument in the Court of Appeals, they were shipped back to Iran um, after the court had denied our, our motion to stay. So this brings us to a bigger point. Legally speaking, can we seize cultural objects? Well, considering our laws were drafted after British laws, I would say probably, because those guys just went on a global shopping spree for a few centuries there. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it's pointed out that the FSIA, or Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, That distinction between commercial and non-commercial property is stated explicitly in the FSIA itself in Section 1602. It's central to the UN Convention on Immunities of States. It was the holding of a recent decision of the International Court of Justice, which barred the seizure of, as it happens, a cultural center. The ICJ barred the seizure of a cultural center because the cultural center is non-commercial, and that case actually involved the victims of Nazi crimes. So, okay, according to the defendant, we can't take non-commercial assets, especially cultural assets that are on loan to our museums and universities. And, unless Iran somehow was monetizing those assets that we borrowed from them during the height of our previous outing in America First policies, it could not be taken by the U.S. The defense raised one more important point as well. We also have concerns in these cases about uh, the recipro reciprocal treatment of our own property abroad. Despite years of trade deficit, there are still many historic American items abroad that they, we would probably not want to see appear on eBay as part of a foreign government's bid to get us to pay our fines for citizens of theirs that we've injured. Although, I know the U.S. has a spotless record on arming radical groups. So now, let's look at the arguments from the man who wanted to seize the Iranian art. Well, first he says that... If somebody wants to bring in that, that property, those... Uh, exhibits can apply to the State Department in advance and receive a letter immunizing th those assets from, from judicial process. And, and that, last year... Did that exist in, what was it, 1939? It did not. It when did not. Chicago got this? But Congress could have made that provision retroactive. Yes, that is one heck of an odd argument. That sounds really dumb until someone explains it to you, at which point you realize it's only kind of dumb. The argument here boils down to Congress should have extended immunities to items that have been imported in the past, but they didn't. So they must have wanted to make antique items on loan vulnerable to government seizure, which is giving a lot of credit to a group that currently has the same approval rating Rotten Tomatoes gave Fifty Shades Freed. The crux of the argument for the acquisition of cultural assets comes from an interpretation of Section 1610G of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. The centerpiece of that legislation is Section 1610G. That provision provides that American terrorism victims can execute their judgments upon the property of a foreign state that is subject that, uh, um, against which a, a judgment has been entered under 1605A, and it makes available the property of the state's agencies and instrumentalities. All right, so now it's time to play a fun game that Supreme Court likes to play, Whose Nuance is Better? Now, the plaintiff in this case says that because of a subsection of Section 1610 says that the government can directly take a foreign country's assets and mention separately the veil-piercing mechanisms that we talked about before in relation to Cuba, that means that the government, if it doesn't want to delve into the bureaucratic cesspool of seeing what is controlled by whom, can just take stuff from a foreign country in order to pay back a fine.
that the property of a foreign state is subject to execution and the property of an agency or instrumentality. Now, if this were only a veil-piercing mechanism, as the respondents claim, there's no reason to mention the property of the foreign state. So this logic, if extrapolated outwards, could mean that the U.S. could steal all sorts of foreign government supplies in order to pay down their debt. Can they uh, execute uh, your clients on the embassy? So uh, on the uh, uniform, uh, on the uniforms that the uh, uh, people in the embassy wear, on on the papers that the ambassador keeps in his desk. If in fact you read as provided in this section, the answer is no. If you read it to include, because it has to be commercial. All right. Under your reading, where those re words must mean something else. Can't they do it? So next time you're in the Iranian embassy, make sure to take a few staples or a pen for America. The plaintiff's response to this was that this could not happen because section 1611, the section right after the one everyone's talking about, protects diplomatic, military, and some central bank assets. Protects military assets? Right now I'm just imagining an Afghanistani walking up to a US tank and taking it because we armed and funded the Taliban during the Soviet occupation. Now this whole argument over 1610 subsection G was resolved by one of the most boring checkmate arguments of all time. As provided in this section, this section is section 1610, that is the section of which G is a subsection. So the phrase as provided in this section means the petitioners have to satisfy the provisions of Section 1610, which means that only property used for commercial activity in the United States can be seized. And petitioners, I think, have just not come up with a plausible alternative account of what, as provided in this section, means. Snap! Basically, by understanding what the basic principles of what a subsection is, whether or not this one subsection meant you can seize an art asset, if the rest of the subsections say it only applies to commercial assets, it only applies to commercial assets. It would be like me saying that the Bill of Rights doesn't protect freedom of religion because the Second Amendment doesn't even mention religious freedoms once. So what happened? Well, only one news station reported on this, Israel's I-24. And their reporting was so unclarifying because it was based on the legally incorrect assumption that Iran wasn't a legitimate state. So I'll just dive right into the primary documents released by the Supreme Court. The unanimous 8-0 decision written by Justice Sotomayor said, Petitioners cannot invoke Section 1610G to attach and execute against the antiquities at issue here which petitioners have not established are exempt from immunity under any other provision in section 1610. Basically, saying that because a petitioner found that one subsection said they could do something, because other subsections in the same section say explicitly this all only applied to commercial assets, those pieces of art could not be seized by the United States. So other countries, feel free to lend us your art. We may study it for 85 plus years, but it'll still have your name on it. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of Supreme Court Saturday, click here. And subscribe by clicking here. And if you enjoyed this episode, remember to like the video below.